Our next presenter is, is Michael Reich, who is the, the Daniel Thirst Distinguished Professor of Social Justice at the University of Maryland and currently a visiting scholar at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, he's a Woodrow Wilson Fellow and a, and a Fulbright Scholar and has published a lot of books and monographs, including the Sage book, Social Policy and Social Justice. He currently serves on five editorial boards, um, which I congratulate him and sort of empathize with him uh, for that role. And he's played uh, an important role in advocating for uh, issues related to poverty and inequality for vulnerable populations, including low-income families and welfare recipients and immigrants and refugees and the homeless. And he's been honored for this work in policy advocacy by many groups, but including the National Association of Social Workers. So please join me in welcoming Michael Reich. Thank you very much, John, and congratulations, Sarah and Sage, for your 50 years of amazing work. And I want to also give a shout out to um, the editor uh, whom, with whom I've worked now for eight years, Cassie Graves, for all of her support and for her commitment to the issues that make Sage such a special journal. Um, as a historian and a social worker, I'm going to tell a little bit different kind of a story. Um, it's a collective story. There are a lot of actors in it. And it's also a story that has ebb and flow. And as someone who lives and works in Baltimore, within spitting distance of where the events of the past week occurred, I'm also speaking in a very personal way about what's been going on and what its implications are. So these recent events in Baltimore have focused the nation's attention not only on police community relations, but once again, seems cyclical, on the causes, characteristics, and consequences of chronic poverty. However, as the response of some policymakers and some media outlets to these events demonstrate, longstanding assumptions about poverty persist. The need for social science research to revise these longstanding attitudes about the poor and about poverty is therefore more important than ever. Now, for millennia, societies attributed poverty to various things, to individual moral failure, to cultural deficiencies, or the absence of divine grace. During the past century, social scientists have attempted to revise these persistent myths with limited success. They have asked different questions, used diverse methods to demonstrate the actual nature and extent of poverty, identify its causes, analyze its short and long-term effects, and establish the relationship between poverty and race, poverty and gender, poverty and health, and even poverty and life expectancy. This research has produced some effective alternative policy solutions, and most recently applied evidence to evaluate the interventions those policies have developed to address the symptoms of poverty. Now, my story begins in the late 19th century. The scientific charity movement at that time, responding in the aftermath of a devastating depression, represented the first systematic effort to identify the causes of poverty through social research. A study conducted in New York by Amos Warner refuted many of the prevailing judgments about the immigrant poor, even as they reflected late Victorian morality and elements of social Darwinism. Now, while the charities organization societies at the time used this research to integrate a, quote, scientific approach into its work with poor individuals and families, researchers during the same era in the settlement house movement challenged the link between poverty and morality, focused on the environmental causes and effects of poverty, and used research as a tool for policy advocacy. In 1904, Robert Hunter, a settlement house worker at Hull House in Chicago, and later at the University Settlement in New York, completed the first scientific comprehensive study of poverty in the United States. Contrary to popular opinion, he found that many, if not most, of the poor were poor as a result of illness, unemployment, or old age. And this promoted, among elites anyway, public discussion of poverty and the need for comprehensive reform. During the next decade, other social work researchers like Mary Van Cleek, 
a fellow in the College Settlement Association of New York, and later the Director of Industrial Studies at the Russell Sage Foundation, and Josephine Goldmark, a resident of the Henry Street Settlement in New York, produced a wide range of reports analyzing such issues as child labor, unemployment, and working conditions in factories, mines, and mills, particularly those which affected women and girls. Van Cleek's research drew national attention to the relationship between low wages and poverty, an issue that persists to this day, and to the absence of laws addressing unsafe industrial and social conditions. Josephine Goldmark was an aggressive investigator of these labor conditions, including the 1911 Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, and wrote prolifically about the health effects of industrial work, low wages, and long hours. In the landmark 1908 Supreme Court case of Muller versus Oregon, she helped write the precedent-setting Brandeis brief, which used social science research in a Supreme Court brief for the first time. Their research led to laws banning child labor and also improving the hours of women and other workers. During this period, statistical research on juvenile delinquency and tenement housing by Edith and Grace Abbott, who were the first women admitted to the sociology factory at the University of Chicago, helped develop strategies to improve urban conditions. Ethnographic and community-based research by African Americans such as W.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells, and George Edmund Haynes illuminated the stark conditions African Americans endured in both the urban North and the rural South, and brought issues such as lynching and chronic unemployment to the public's attention for the first time. Research by social workers at the Children's Bureau on maternal and child health ultimately produced the Shepherd Towner Act, the first federal health care legislation in 1921. And the combined impact of all of this social science research eventually provided the foundation for the policies that emerged during the New Deal. After the progressive era faded, however, three different approaches to the use of social science research emerged. Research in the um, child guidance movement, for example, blended psychodynamic theory into studies on delinquency. Um, the early, and the, used the earliest examples of what we now call intervention research to transform subjective charity work into objective social casework with families. This created the rational scientific framework for social work practice, which continues to be influential today. The newly formed, <coughs> excuse me, health and welfare councils, which were created by the uh, community chest movement, used survey research to promote strategies that could help millions of immigrants assimilate. Other community researchers, such as Mary Parker Follett in Cincinnati, Paul Kellogg in Pittsburgh, and Edward Lindemann in New York, used survey research for different purposes. They wanted to create what Mary Parker Follett called a new state and enhance civic participation among its members. And finally, during a decade in which the Ku Klux Klan reached the height of its political power, African American researchers continued to struggle to use their research to bring the consequences of individual and institutional racism into the mainstream of social concern. Now, this split among researchers, some of which it con uh, continues to this day, existed even as strong, more strongly during the Great Depression. Helen Hall's studies of unemployment that was sponsored by the National Federation of Settlements demonstrated once again that the roots of unemployment and poverty were systemic, not individual. During the Depression, because so many people were unemployed, this drew a more sympathetic audience. University-based scholars and researchers in public welfare departments used more advanced statistical analyses for the first time, new qualitative research methods such as ethnography, and significantly innovative ways to disseminate their research to illuminate the consequences of poverty and to promote a wide range of alternative solutions from rural cooperatives to the first welfare state policies. Researchers in private family service agencies, however, the descendants of the charities movement, took a different approach. They focused on such issues as intergenerational conflict among immigrant families and emphasized the primacy of individual family relations. Now, ironically, 
Nearly all of these researchers during the period of the Great Depression overlooked the specific conditions of women and racial minorities, the populations most affected by po uh, poverty. It took a book by a Swedish social scientist, Gunnar Myrdal, in 1944, titled Race and American Dilemma, to demonstrate the connection between poverty and race to a wider audience. Now, these different approaches to research underscore three recurrent tensions among social scientists in the area of poverty research. One is the distinction between a problem focus that looks at individual causation and an environmental focus to poverty. Another dispute in which I've been involved a little bit is to what extent advocacy-oriented research violates principles of scientific investigation and the tenets of professionalism. A third is whether social science should provide the foundation for developing anti-poverty policies, or as Daniel Patrick Moynihan once said, only for measuring their results. Now, in the aftermath of the Second World War, social scientists became, to use Christopher Lash's phrase, doctors to a uh, sick society. While the repressive political climate of McCarthyism compels social scientists to abandon the study of community and social issues. So as a result, by a little before SAGE was founded, by the end of the 1940s, the connection be between research and social policy had largely disappeared. Now ironically, this focus on individual deviance rather than environmental factors eventually produced research that asked, why does widespread poverty persist in an era of unprecedented prosperity. Now this research over the next several decades took several forms. Richard Cloward and Lloyd Olin, sociologists, developed opportunity theory to revise traditional explanations about the causes of juvenile delinquency. Over 45 years ago, Andrew Billingsley published Children of the Storm, which analyzed the racial implications of the nation's child welfare system a theme that Jonathan Kozel later examined in such books as Rachel and Her Children. Their work eventually led to programs that emphasized strafing families as a means of protecting children's well-being. In the 1950s and 1960s, research by anthropologist Oscar Lewis and by Michael Harrington identified the patterns of cultural adaptation produced by chronic poverty. Now, their goal was to heighten Americans' awareness of the extent and consequences of poverty even during the post-war boom. But unfortunately, then and now, their culture of poverty thesis has been inverted by politicians and the media to explain the causes of poverty rather than the effects of poverty. This belief that cultural norms produce poverty continues to influence American attitudes today as some of the courage, uh, coverage in the events of my hometown, Baltimore, demonstrated. Since the 1970s, social science research about poverty in the United States has largely focused on the conditions of specific marginalized populations, African Americans, single mothers, children in foster care. William Julius Wilson demonstrated the devastating consequences of deindustrialization on the African American community. Douglas Massey pointed out how public policies have created what he called American apartheid. Kathy Eden has studied the impact of mass incarceration on the ability of low income women and men to form stable families. Public health researchers have revealed the long term effects of poverty on physical and mental health. My work and the work of other colleagues has looked at the effects of welfare reform and healthcare reform, not only on the people who are the clients of these systems, but on the organizations, particularly small and mid-sized nonprofit organizations that are critical for people's survival in hard times. And even just yesterday, research in the New York Times highlighted the connections between children's poverty and the place where they grow up. Perhaps most powerfully in terms of contemporary research, a colleague of mine at Washington University in St. Louis, Mark Rank, has found that a majority of Americans and 91% of African Americans 
are poor for an extended period in their lives. And we all know now what the devastating effects of an extended period of poverty are, particularly if people experience them in childhood. Isabel Sawhill has concluded that if we measured poverty accurately in the United States, about 100 million Americans would be considered poor. We can only speculate on the impact on American attitudes about poverty and the poor, particularly in light of recent events, if such findings were more widely disseminated. So how can research in the future be scientific and still serve the goal of social justice? So let me make a few suggestions. First, maybe we should study why these attitudes about the poor and poverty persist in light of a century of really good scientific evidence to the contrary. But maybe here are a few things that we could do. We could balance research on the effectiveness of interventions that address the symptoms of poverty with analyses of the relationship between these symptoms and the structural changes that are producing not only greater inequality, but more serious chronic poverty. We should create studies that enable marginalized populations to find their voice, to define their own realities through mixed methods research, for example, by making them full partners in all phases of the research. And finally, we could disseminate our findings more widely and more creatively to influence public attitudes and potentially influence public policy more effectively and enable Americans to use these data to improve the quality of their lives and particularly the lives of the least fortunate in our society. Thank you very much.